Hello, I'm Dr. Darlene Assistel Ray, your host for Impacting the Classroom podcast. And I'm um, just touching base with you today to let you know that Marnetta and I are off this week. So if you're looking for our latest episode, please tune back and check us out in early February and we'll, we'll be um, there and ready to give you a great listen. In the meantime, we wanted you to have an opportunity to listen to a recorded NACI presentation that was uh, put together for the NACI's annual com conference. And for those of you looking for great recommendations, strategies, and suggestions, I think you'll find great value there. Or if you have missed maybe any of our episodes that we have already recorded, I encourage you to go back and give those a listen. Uh, especially think about episode two with Dr. Rosemarie Allen who really stretched our thinking around equity as an action word and the, you know, just the encouragement to conduct equity audits. I also think of our most recent episode with the folks from Quebec who, who were successful in scaling up universal pre-K with an eye on quality. So if you happen to miss that one, I encourage you to go back and listen to that as well. So many great uh, episodes already. And so please go back and listen to those. There's ones on funding, continuous quality improvement. So I, uh, t take time to give those a listen. And until then, we'll see you back in early February and look forward to our next session. So take care, continue to make great impact uh, across our programs, across um, our states and our nation, as well as uh, globally. We appreciate all that you do. See you next time. Welcome everyone to our presentation on building equity with continuous quality improvement. My name is Megan Cornwell. I'm the content marketing manager here at Teachstone, and I'm just joining today as our moderator. With me is um, our three guests, Marnetta Larimer, Kate Klein, and Suzanne Morris. And I'd love for you guys to introduce yourselves. My name is Marnetta Larimer. I am a professional services manager here at Teachstone. Um, I do love the um, stance we've taken with all the things that's been happening in the country. Um, so very excited to be part of this team and part of the work that they are doing. Uh, so my name is Kate Klein. I'm a professional services manager also here at Teachstone. And uh, my focus is on continuous quality improvement, our efforts uh, within the company and within our department and um, how we support that out there in the early childhood world. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Suzanne Morris. I'm the Senior Director of Public Policy and Government Relations at Teachstone. So let's talk a little bit and frame our discussion today. And it's a brief discussion um, with a lot of things in it. And it really just touches on some of the work that we are doing here, just to give you an idea of where we are. When we think about equity, it's about when everyone has what they need, when they need it, right? Yeah. And the core of the work that we do here at Teachstone evolves around equity, helping every child and every educator to be successful. So to be more equitable in the classroom, we have to implement a system of continuous quality improvement. So we're going to be talking about where, uh, what CQI is and how class fits into that framework and also provide some strategies that you can implement as a teacher or a coach to be more equitable. So let's talk about what CQI is. And I'm going to give this over to you, Kate, because like this is your baby. Like, <laughs> you are so pumped when you talk about this work. So talk to us about CQI. Sure. Well, I think a lot of people may already sort of identify with continuous quality improvement as this process of looking at what's going on in programs, identifying what's happening and um, this cyclical process. Right. Uh, but I want to back up and say that continuous quality improvement is a commitment. It's really a large commitment that everyone on the staff has to make and it creating this culture of being vulnerable right of being able to say i'm not sure what to do next let's look at our data what do we see how do we move forward what's one thing we can do let's try it out and see what happens um and that can that commitment to creating that culture together is very important um, because we know that we're trying to impact outcomes for children. So that's yeah. the greatest commitment we can make. So committing to getting better at getting better, as we say, for continuous quality improvement. So a lot of people think about this as 
plan, do, study, act, right? Taking a look at what's going on, studying what's happening, uh, try it out, right? And then that's the do part. And then look back at what happened. That's that's the study part. And then once we figure out what we find from our data, then we make a new plan and right, it's the cyclical process. So really thinking about continuous quality improvement as, as it says here on the slide, the intersection of accountability and improvement. Um, and I would say we're all accountable, mm -hmm. right? And we're all accountable to making the improvements. And so it's really figuring out where we fit in, right, to that cycle. And uh, as I said, making that commitment to the culture of learning, to being vulnerable, to trusting each other, but also knowing that you have good data. It's really, really hard to know where to go if you don't trust the data that you find. So being data driven in these decisions that we make is very important. And then not just doing it once, like you were saying, it's it's a it's a walk, not a run. And it's not even a sprint where you just like, <laughs> it is a systematic thing where we continuously look at what's going on as a cycle. We build it into our week, our month, you know, our year as looking at maybe different things throughout the year, but um, not forgetting that it's time to, there's always time to step back, right? And look at what's happening, make a plan, um, and then enact that and keep it up. So that's really what continuous quality improvement is about. Um, but thinking about how does that intersect with equity? Thanks for that overview. So Suzanne, tell me more about what CQI means for policymakers. Um, that's a great question, Megan. I think for policymakers at this point in time, CQI really presents a tremendous opportunity to think deeply and thoughtfully about how quality supports are making it into the classroom. And I'm really thinking about state leaders, primarily that are implementing quality rating and improvement systems. We have 44 states in this country that have implemented some form of a QRIS. And so for our audience, um, most likely you're living in a place that has a QRIS and maybe working through the, the performance standards that your state's QRIS has. What CQI offers um, when it's really embedded and really serves as the foundation for a robust QRIS system is it allows for an iterative conversation of growth in each individual classroom. Um, so that means for policymakers, it's really making um, strategic choices around investments. So having coaches that are um, trained and have competencies readily available to them and they're supported in their training that are available to classrooms across the board. Um, and that you have teachers that have the time to actually participate in the CQI uh, process and having time for reflection and having time to have the conversation with their coach. It also means developing mentorship and allowing for that growth to happen within programs. Um, and so you have these two pieces of the puzzle coming together to support the CQI process. It also probably means some structural changes for QRIS and in how um, quality is recognized and what that means within an entire system. So to have a truly equitable quality rating and improvement system, you have to make room for cultural competencies, um, for neighborhood reflections, for expectations, for the population that's being served in a given program. And so that means you, you might have some variation in the system. And that's very different for states. States usually, you know, they, they like to have expectation. They like to know the known. <laughs> they like to know basically what they're getting themselves into. And so it's a shift in thinking for policymakers when you have true CQI that's embedded deep deeply in these quality supports. It may be QRIS, it may be through coaching. Um, states are a little bit all over the place in their CQI conversations right now. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity for these conversations. I know that uh, with the pandemic 
it having happened and we're still in the middle of it, it's, it's, it's still very much an uncertain time for the field. Um, but we do have significant federal investments that have given states somewhat um, of a leeway in thinking about their systems. Now, majority of those investments are going to stabilize the field and hopefully we'll start to build the foundation for equitable compensation that our teachers so deserve and is so long overdue. If we have this strong foundation of child care subsidy rates and compensation, maybe it's wage scales, however it comes through from the state, when you have a strong foundation of teachers that are well supported financially, you can start to build that CQI process on top of that because then they, they're not pulled in so many directions because they know that they're going to be able to put food on the table for their own families. They're able to access healthcare. They're able to do all of those things that can really challenge the CQI process in teachers being able to fully participate because when they're stressed and under-resourced, that process becomes very, very challenging to implement in the classroom and at the program level. I, I love that. And then we talk about biases, right? And, you know, making sure that we are, you know, doing things in an equitable, you know, manner. That's, that's why trusting the data is important because it's objective. It's removed from feelings and thoughts, right? It's, you know, a course of action, a course of things that happen that give us an outcome that we can look back on and reflect and use, right? So it takes the personal out of it and makes it something concrete that we can use to, um, pivot <laughs> um, and level kind of the work that we we're doing. Right. And being open enough to stay, um, especially when we look at our interactions with, with children, to be able to say, what am I missing here as a teacher, mm -hmm. right? Or what am I noticing as a coach? What am I noticing as a leader in my classrooms where inequities are happening? And how do we get uh, brave enough to have those conversations so that we really are ensuring that everybody gets what they need when they need it. Right. The children, the teachers, right. Everybody. And knowing that it doesn't reflect on you as a teacher, <laughs> right. It doesn't make you less of an effective teacher, right. This is another tool, another way for us to reach our children on a whole nother level and provide them with the supports that they need in an individual manner. So um, when we think about that equity and that tie to CQI, right, it's ensuring that high quality experiences, you know, for all children, um, you know, consist of us meeting them where they are, you know, and it really lies when you talked about the plan, do, study, and act, right, in the heart of that ongoing cycle, right? We're planning as teachers, we're doing, right? We're studying um, and then um, we're acting on that data. So these changes are supported through those formal informal data collections that we already have in place um, in some form or fashion in our environments. Yeah. So what do we do, right? right. <laughs> so we have, a. I mean, we talked about a lot. <laughs> what do we do with that, right? How do we help people start on this journey or yeah. provide more um, supports to continue on or go deeper into this um, equity right. journey? And I think the first one here on the slide is really what you were starting to get at, that as a teacher, I can't be afraid that something I try out might not work, right? Because then I won't try anything new. And teachers are very um, innovative, usually people anyway. Really, um, teachers who care are continually looking for um, the children that are, to make sure the children are getting what they need in their classroom. What we don't always notice are um, the times when um, we're preoccupied with something or we have an unconscious reaction to something or something we don't even, we're not intentionally, right? Um, trying to create an inequitable um, access to, really that's what, as a teacher, thinking about providing the highest quality environment for my children in my classroom. I need to make sure that everyone in my classroom has equitable access to learning experiences. Yeah. So that's the materials and the curriculum and everything that I'm providing, but it's also me as the teacher, because I'm important in terms of um, the facilitator of that learning. So if children have inequitable access to me through a strained relationship, 
they're withdrawn, I'm withdrawn from them, whatever the thing might be happening, right? Because we're humans interacting in a classroom. <laughs> when these things happen, then children have less access to learning because these interactions are strained. And so, first of all, as a teacher, I have to be brave to try to reach out, to try to learn and grow. And then another thing to think about is stepping back to think about who in my classroom am I connecting with regularly? Mm -hmm. and are good. And I know that we're getting this, you know, they have good access to learning. And who has, am I missing? Who are the quiet children? Who are the, the children that maybe have um, had some challenges in the classroom and now we're kind of on this negative spiral, right? In our relationship where I'm expecting um, challenges and they're expecting me to react in a certain way and our relationship is strained. So one of the things I can do is spend more time one-on-one -on -one and rebuild trust in that relationship with that child. And banking time is a way to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's um, something to think about. It's really, it's a, a process of implementing these one-on-one -on -one interactions with children um, short term uh, for a week on a, like a weekly, maybe a couple times each week, um, not forever, but in terms of just rebuilding the trust and in that relationship. And then the other thing that I can do as a teacher is really making sure that I'm focusing on social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. We've heard so much about learning loss, right? During COVID and uh, wherever children were, they were learning something. They weren't <laughs> yes. out doing nothing, right? They were interacting with whoever was caring for them and whatever that situation was, they were learning something. And so we have this um, fear that they're behind. And so we want to um, dive into the deep end and get them caught up with all their skills. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have that foundation of the social emotional skills that they need in terms of relationships, mm -hmm. relationships with adults and peers, no matter what they learn in terms of academic skills, it won't go, they won't be able to really, you know, fully utilize that learning without being able to get along with people. So, and manage their own emotions, right? All of those things. All of those things. You said so much and I didn't want to interrupt because I'm just like, so I'm just like, I don't want to interrupt her. Like there's so much <laughs> stuff coming out, but you said a lot of key things, right? You were talking about <clears throat> being a teacher and being in the classroom and recognizing who you're spending more time with, you know, um, relationships, things like that, you know, it's so important to note, like when we talk about, you know, equity, we talk about trauma, right, and, you know, individualizing our care with students, you know, whether it be conscious or unconscious, because a lot of times, like you said, we just move through our course of the day, we don't really think about the things, and we may not notice some of the behaviors that we demonstrate, but children are always watching, and children are always learning, and so now those, you know, actions that you are doing that you're not aware of, other children are seeing, and so if you're not spending time with Johnny, for instance, right? Um, you're spending more time with Mary. Like, children are going to mimic those same behaviors, right? So now Johnny's not going to be asked to play because the teacher don't like you. We don't like you either, right? Like, teacher doesn't want to spend time with you. Um, so why would we, right? So all of our actions, whether intentional or unintentional, really impact, you know, what's happening in that classroom, how children feel about themselves, right? We're talking about social emotional learning. Um, and so we just, we do, we have to be, just be very mindful. And you're right, that banking time is a you know, great opportunity to be intentional about, you know, reflecting on our practices in the classroom, our relationships with the children, and how we can make those stronger so that they can learn. Because, I mean, if you ever think about it, you know, I know that I had a teacher <laughs> who I was not a fan of. Like, I don't care how smart they were. Like, I'm sure they were, like, I know now that they were brilliant, but I knew that they were not for me. They did not like me or whatever. And there was nothing that they could tell me that was of any value to me. Right. And we don't want to be those teachers in the, in the class. Right. So for learning to happen, those attachments, those relationships, that trust has to be there. So. Right. And like you were saying, it it uh, is compounded by the fact that children are learning from you. So not only are those children not getting as much access to you and the learning opportunities you provide, they're then isolated from their peers. Right. And they're, they're not getting those learning experiences either. So the gap widens. And um, what we can do in terms of equity, right, is, to, is making sure that as teachers, we are going through this process of trial and error and focusing on continuously improving the quality of what's happening in our, um, in our classrooms 
regularly stepping back to look at that. Yeah. And knowing your students, right? Because, you know, just because a child cries doesn't mean they're sad. You know, some people cry because they're happy, right? And if they hurt themselves, they may not want you to run over. They may need a moment to themselves, right? So it's really, you know, observing, right? And knowing your children, getting to know them, building that relationship so that you can provide the supports, right? And the assistance to them that really meets what they need as an individual. I, I can talk about this like forever. <laughs> <laughs> forever. So great strategies um, for teachers to either start using um, or add to their tool belts, belts that they already have. So I appreciate you running through that. So what about for coaches? Like, you know, when, yeah. so teachers, you know, in order to create an equitable learning environment, you talked about it being an intentional thing that needs to happen. You know, teachers and students need that individualized support to meet them where they are and develop a plan to reach their potential. Um, you know, tar efforts can be targeted to specific classrooms or practices, or you can find new ways to build, you know, on teacher skills and mindsets. We talked about the teachers. How can the coaches support those teachers in those efforts? Right, right. What in the earlier slide it said equity is reached when everyone has what they need when they need it. And so um, in schools, we often think about the children first, which we should, right? Because they're <laughs> why we are there. And in addition to that, as coaches and administrators, we're there for the adults in the classroom, the teachers, whatever role they have in the classroom, making sure that they have what they need when they need it. Do they have the support? Uh, do they have the materials and resources to the best of your ability as the coach or, or leader in that program so that they can provide an equitable uh, learning environment for the children in their classroom? So um, a couple of things to think about around that for coaches is, really reflecting as the coach, right? We are used to sitting with teachers and reflecting with them, right? Yeah. Guiding them through a reflective process, but also thinking as the coach, right? What is this community that I work in? What are the needs in this community, right? What are the characteristics of this group that I support? Um, how do I take what I know of the people that I support into planning for what these teachers need? Um, so that they're getting what they need when they need it also. And um, the other thing that sometimes gets lost in the shuffle, and we talk a lot about self-care um, for adults, but, and that's, it, it, it is important. I, I feel like my tone was like, ah, oh, we talk about that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the reason why I, I, I take that kind of stance is that who's checking up to make sure that it's happening, right? right. Because staffing issues happen, right? We have not enough people. Uh, people are ill or out under different circumstances, not in the classroom, helping out in other areas of the program. Different things are happening. And it feels like um, just racing to keep up with that. Mm -hmm. And so I think strategizing around self-care to make sure that it's not just lip service, right? Because we are losing teachers left and right we from are. our class. We are. And um, it really, it's, it's going to impact, it impacts coworkers, it impacts the children, right? It impacts everybody. So really thinking about what can you actually do rather than um, just saying, make, make sure you're taking care of yourself, you know, right? how do we, how do we um, build it in? What kinds of supports can I, as a coach, provide for teachers? Places to uh, gather, talk, think together, laugh together, cry together, right? Um, together and strategize so that um, support isn't just about like, oh, are you meditating every day or whatever? Support is also really working together to find solutions and to build um, growth into a program. Uh, it's a longer term view than making sure you're taking 10 minutes a day of quiet time or something right. like that, but it will um, help build the confidence in the program. When people are connected, uh, they decide to stay even when things are, are tough. And when you, in, like as an organization, right, protect that time. You say that this is important. So 
this is it above all else. Like, this is what we are doing. Like, that says a lot too. Because, you know, like you said, when you talk about lip service, you can put it on my calendar and you can say that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. But if you overload it with other things or you say, oh, just move that around, that's not telling me that that's important and that you really value, you know, the need for me to have that time to get done what I need to get done. Right. So as a coach, if my role is to make sure that the people that I support have what they need when they need it, how do I make sure that I'm speaking up on their behalf too about what they need? Yeah, <laughs> Most definitely. Oh, that was good. Um, and great strategies. I think you covered a lot of different things. And I think in working together, you know, with the strategies that you, we talked about with the teachers and the coaches, we really can start moving and shifting um, some of the equity issues, not all of them, right? We have to remember that this, again, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a big thing, right? That we're really battling and um, trying to get a hold of. So we have to be patient and know that it's gonna take time and we have to celebrate all the little steps, right? committing to that process for sure. <laughs> most definitely um you have been amazing kate is there anything that you want to say before i wrap this up uh i think i just said it right it's the commitment it's the commitment because um in order to to get to equity we have to commit to doing better every day mm -hmm. um, um inequities happen uh because you know, for a variety of reasons, but what are the things that we can control, right? And commit to making those things better each day for ourselves and for our children. Um, we, we are building the future. I always say that to people, right? Teaching is building the future. And, you know, what kind of future are we building for the world, right? Through the relationships that we have in our schools and our classrooms as coaches and teachers and leaders. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Marnetta. And thank you, Suzanne, for adding your perspectives to this conversation. And to wrap us up, I just want to summarize everything that we've talked about. So that's acknowledging that equity is at the heart of everything that we strive to do as educators. Um, and it's that the core of everything we're doing at Teach Stone. Um, and we want to see our mission that every child and every educator has an opportunity to succeed. And to do that, we can use CQI as a framework to allow us to reach the more equitable system and class provides the professional development and the data that goes hand in hand with the CQI process. If you have any questions about how class fits into your equity plans, please contact us. We're always available at learnmore at teachstone.com. And if you want more tips about teaching with class, don't miss our new podcast, Teaching with Class, which you can find on any podcast platform. These are 20-minute episodes packed full of tips for teachers to help you be more intentional about your interactions with students. So I hope you'll check that out. Um, we just released it a couple months ago, and it's been really great. So thanks again, and, and have a great day. It's, it's been wonderful, and thanks again to our presenters. Bye-bye. COVID shined a light on the issues that the early education field had already been struggling with for years. Going back to normal is simply not good enough. Our teachers deserve more. If you're ready to be bold, address systemic inequity, and elevate the workforce, we invite you to join us March 15th through 17th for Interact Now, a class summit. Choose from 30 sessions over three days and network with leading experts, share your work, and meet colleagues across the world. Visit teachstone.com interact to learn more and register.